Ah. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you will agree with me that we live in an extravagantly beautiful and vast universe. The scale of it is something that not only inspires us, but also humbles us. Uh, take, for example, a galaxy. This is a fairly typical spiral galaxy. And a galaxy like this is composed of about half a trillion stars, 500 billion stars. Even more mass is in dust and gas. And the, everything rotates around a common center. Uh, the, the sun, for example, takes about a quarter billion years to go once around the Milky Way galaxy. Now, end to end, this galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. Light year, of course, is, is a unit of distance. It's the distance light travels in one year going at 186,000 miles per second. So it's about six trillion miles. Multiply that by 100,000, you get a sense of how big a single galaxy is. But in the universe, there are scales far bigger than galaxies. This, for example, is a lovely picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And amazingly, every little blob you see in this picture is not a star, but an entire galaxy, a galaxy of billions or hundreds of billions of stars. There's about a little bit over 1,000 galaxies in this image. And it actually represents one of the deepest views into the universe we've ever taken. Some of these galaxies are on the order of 12 billion light years away. And that's really wonderful because what that means is that light took that long to travel to us. When you look at a galaxy 12 billion light years away, you see it as it was 12 billion years ago. So we have a ringside seat as astronomers to sit back and collect light and actually watch the universe unfold, the history, in front of us. Now, it's worth mentioning, okay, 2,000 galaxies in this image alone, um, how much of the sky does this rep represent? There's all of these galaxies in the sky. It may surprise you to know that this whole image, the amount of sky on this is equivalent, this is really true, to looking at the eye of a needle held at arm's length against the sky. So if you look through the eye of a needle in any direction on the sky, you're gonna see between 1,000 and 2,000 galaxies. Think about the amount of matter, the amount of material in our universe. Amazingly, right now, we think all of this stuff is just a tiny bit of the whole. This shows you what we think the current energy content of our universe is. And honestly, this is a little embarrassing. I want to explain to you why we would possibly believe something like this. By energy content, our universe is about 73% something called dark energy. And this was discovered only about 10 years ago. You may have heard the universe is expanding. Well, it turns out it's not only expanding, it's actually accelerating. The galaxies are flying faster and faster apart all the time. And it takes a lot of energy to actually accelerate an entire universe. Uh, we've made great strides in explaining what this mysterious energy is. We've given it a name. Uh, that's about as far as we've gotten. Um, the, <laughs> the reason we call it dark is just that. It means we know nothing about it. Uh, we're going to talk today more about the matter content of the universe, and that's not a whole lot better. All the matter that I just showed you, the billions of galaxies, uh, we believe that everything that's made up of the stuff that we are made of, regular matter, makes up about 4% of the universe. And it's even more depressing than that, because all of the exciting stuff, like stars, galaxies, planets, all of that, that's about 0.4%. And the other 3.6% is just cold gas between the galaxies. The remaining 23% is something called dark matter. And this is a new form of matter that we have no idea, again, what it is, hence the word dark. Uh, as far as we know, dark energy and dark matter are not related. Yet another reason not to let astronomers name anything. Uh, it's very confusing. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about dark matter. How could we possibly believe that everything we see is only about 4% of the matter of the energy of the universe? Now, this actually goes back quite a ways, <laughs> and it's been annoying astronomers for quite some time. Uh, th th this annoyed astronomer is named Fritz Zwicky, and uh, uh, Zwicky in the 1930s began to study clusters of galaxies. Galaxies, if they're close enough together, can actually orbit around each other, even collide together under the force of gravity, despite the fact that the universe is expanding, and it definitely is. If galaxies are dense enough and close enough, gravity can overcome the expansion of the universe. And Zwicky was studying clusters of galaxies all orbiting around each other. What he found is that the speed of the galaxies was far too high. These galaxies should just fly apart. They shouldn't be clustering at all. And when he did the measurement, this is a beautiful picture of a small cluster of galaxies from Hubble Space Telescope. When he did the measurement, he found that you needed about 80 to 90% more mass in these galaxies to account for them not flying apart. 
He didn't know what this was. He said, well, maybe it's some kind of missing mass, some kind of dark matter that we don't know what it is yet. In the 1960s, Vera Rubin realized this problem was still true closer to home. She was studying our own Milky Way galaxy. And I mentioned that we all orbit the center of the Milky Way. Well, the sun is actually going so fast around the center of the Milky Way, we should fly off into space. Instead, there really is this mysterious unseen presence that binds the galaxy together. And uh, both us and other spiral galaxies, it's about the same. There's about 80 to 90% more mass in them than we can account for by just adding up all the stars, even estimating how much cold gas there would be between the stars. So this is a pretty big problem. At first, we really didn't think there was anything necessarily very exotic about this dark matter. We were just beginning to take pictures of distant galaxies. Maybe this missing material could be in a form of lots of cold gas between the stars, cold gas even between the galaxies. Um, maybe it's lots of black holes. Black holes are collapsed dead stars. The gravity is so intense it actually sucks in light. No light coming from those. Could be lots of black holes out there. Um, there was actually a little bit of a battle of the acronyms. Um, some people said that maybe all of this matter is contained in lots and lots of giant planets. And they called them massive, compact, halo objects, or machos. And uh, there was a competing school that said, well, no, 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 maybe we're thinking about this all the wrong way. Maybe this dark matter is a type of new elementary particle we haven't found yet. And they coined the term the weakly interacting massive particle, or WIMPs. So uh, this was actually what we thought at first might be what the missing mass was made of. The problem is, over the last few decades, we have made better and better telescopes. And we now have been able to eliminate most of these things. For example, cold gas. It turns out dark matter is not cold gas. Uh, this is an all-sky image. You know, wrap this image all the way around you, looking in all directions of the sky. And uh, the, the Planck telescope can see extremely cold gas, gas that is only a couple degrees above absolute zero. Any sort of normal cold gas between the stars and galaxies would show up on this survey. And sure enough, we found plenty of it that we'd never seen before, but not enough to account for anywhere near the amount of matter needed for this missing mass problem. It's not black holes. You'd think that black holes would be very hard to observe because they don't give off any light of their own. In fact, what black holes do is that as matter falls into them, the matter gets accelerated faster and faster around the black hole, and black holes actually, actually become little natural particle accelerators. This is an X-ray map of the sky. Black holes heat gas up as it spirals into them before it falls in, and they emit X-rays. And we've done a wonderful survey now of the entire X-ray sky. We have identified thousands of new black holes. And we actually, just by doing statistics, think there are millions more we haven't discovered. But once again, all the black holes added up don't even help us by a fraction of a percent. It's a tiny amount. And uh, unfortunately for the, uh, the acronym people, we, we now know it's not machos. It's not giant planets. These are images from one of the deepest surveys of the sky we've done called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. With the Sloan survey, we're actually filling in slowly the entire sky. This is looking at the northern part of our galaxy and then the southern part of our galaxy. We're not quite done with the whole sky yet. But strip by strip, we're finding thousands of these giant planets. We call them brown dwarfs now. We know of many of them. We're doing census. We, we understand exactly what the statistics are. There is still nothing close to 90% of the mass. So now we're left with this situation. Uh, with a lovely quote from Sir, Car Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of your Sherlock Holmes, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. We've eliminated all of the easy explanations to what all of this mass can be. Instead, it must be something more exotic. Now, this stuff is really dark. Not only does it not emit any light at any energy, not radio waves, not microwaves, any sort of normal matter made of atoms would emit light in some way. It doesn't reflect light. It's very odd. The, uh, uh, the, the only thing that we can detect about dark matter is its gravity. It holds galaxy clusters together. It holds even single galaxies together. And 100 years on, the world's expert in gravity is still Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein described gravity as a curvature of space and actually a curvature of time as well. Anything with mass curves space around it. I actually am curving space a little bit around me. Something like the sun does it a whole lot more. And some of the, the better tests of Albert Einstein's theory involve the sun. To give you an idea, uh, this is a diagram where you actually see the sun here in the middle. Here's Earth, uh, not to scale, luckily. We'd be burnt up. But uh, 
Um, if you have a very sensitive telescope, when you look at the edge of the sun, you actually see all of these stars kind of crowded up by the rim of the sun. And uh, this was first observed during a solar eclipse when the sun's light was conveniently blocked out. Now we can observe it routinely. It turns out that those stars crowded up by the rim of the sun are actually physically behind the sun. Their light should be blocked by the disk of the sun between us and the star. But the curvature due to gravity, the sun is creating a curvature of space which bends the light around it. And we can see stars behind the sun. And what Einstein did is he could predict this angle absolutely perfectly. If you know the angle that something is deflected, you know the mass of the object that's creating that. It works time and time again. So here's what we're now doing. This is a real picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. This has not been modified. And what you see here is a cluster of galaxies. These are all galaxies orbiting around each other in the foreground. And you'll notice there's kind of this weird blue. It's actually a galaxy right here. There's a similar one here. There's a similar one here. And there are these strange streaked out arcs. Again, this is a real picture from the Hubble, not, not changed. What we now realize is that what we're seeing is a galaxy behind this cluster of galaxies. And the light is being lensed into multiple images and smeared out gravitational arcs, we call them. Using this, we're measuring the mass of the clusters of galaxies and finding out, once again, they contain about 90% more mass than we think they should. Here's a, a wonderful picture from Hubble. You see all of these lenses, all of these arcs caused by dark matter. This is now how we find dark matter. We look for these arcs and map dark matter using this. So the plot thickens a little bit. Uh, this is actually a cluster of galaxies that really is two groups of galaxies colliding together. It's called the bullet cluster. That's about a billion light years away and, and many, many millions of light years across. Again, pretty much everything you see in this frame are galaxies except for a couple foreground stars that got in the way. Now, these two clusters of galaxies are flying through each other. They're actually going to combine and make one big cluster. And there's a lot of gas in between the galaxies that has gotten rammed together by the force of this collision. When you look at the same frame in X-rays, this is about the same scale, actually. Uh, this is from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. All of this light you see here is million-degree gas, gas between the galaxies that has been shocked and heated and actually bent into these beautiful shock waves as these two galaxy clusters stick into one big galactic cluster. But here's the problem. This is a false color image, and this is the same galaxy cluster we saw before. In this case, the kind of pink colored haze you see here is where we see that hot X-ray gas as the two galaxy clusters combine into one. On either side, where you see a blue coloring, that's where we see the gravitational lensing. That's where we don't see any matter, but we see the evidence of gravity, of dark matter. And amazingly, what seems to have happened is that as one galaxy, came, one galaxy cluster came this way and another came that way, all of the galaxies and gas stuck, smacked up against each other, and the dark matter sailed right on through. Didn't interact with regular matter at all. And so uh, if you're ever feeling a little bit arrogant, just to remind you, this is sort of your anti-motivation poster, uh, what we now know is as far as dark matter goes, uh, you know, congratulations, most of the universe cannot be bothered to interact with you. Dark matter is seriously strange stuff. Now, um, it's, it's kind of fun to note that we actually have proof of dark matter from a di very different type of astronomy. Uh, this is back in the 1960s. Uh, people named Penzias and Wilson had a microwave antenna that was looking at microwave sources of radiation in the sky. And there was a problem with their antenna because everywhere they looked in the sky, there was an underlying hiss. There was noise in the background. And no matter where they pointed the antenna, it was exactly the same. So, of course, you would figure that this sort of consistent noise means there's a problem with your telescope. And the most likely explanation, they thought, was pigeons. Uh, pigeon poo, here's something for you to take home tonight, uh, trivia, is a very good generator of microwaves and radio waves. And so they trapped all the pigeons. This is a pigeon trap that you can actually see in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. They scooped out all the pigeon poo, they turned their antenna back on, and lo and behold, that hiss was still there. Now, it was very quiet, very small. In fact, it corresponded to a temperature of microwaves of 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Very, very faint. And, and luckily, somebody very quickly realized that this had been a specific prediction of the Big Bang Theory. You see, the Big Bang Theory said that once everything was much denser and hotter, 
And in fact, it was so hot and dense at one point, about 13.7 billion years ago, that the universe itself was opaque to light. Light was trapped in a soup of energy and matter. And then there was a moment as the universe became less and less dense where light could actually freely fly and be released. And the prediction of the Big Bang Theory is that this radiation today should be at 2.7 degrees. We were detecting radiation from 13.7 billion light years away. We now have mapped that radiation. At first, we thought it was entirely smooth over the entire sky. Now we know there are small variations. And these are two maps from our latest mission. The colors, the red and the blue, show you areas where the microwaves are a little bit hotter and a little bit colder. The difference between the hot and cold areas is less than one millionth of a degree. This is a picture of the universe as it appeared 13.7 billion years ago when there was nothing but hydrogen, almost all the same temperature. And we realized that if we look very closely at these variations, this is a sort of the whole thing kind of flattened out, there's a pattern to the variations in this microwave background. In fact, we can actually see sound waves propagating through the entire universe. We're modeling that now, and the way sound waves propagate through something tells you something about its density. Uh, sound travels faster through water than it does through air. So using the microwave background, we can actually track sound waves through the entire universe and find the density of the universe as a whole. You know, you know that old cliche about in space, no one can hear you scream? So 13.7 you know, billion years ago, the universe was dense enough, they could have heard you scream. And uh, you would have been screaming because the temperature was about 4,000 degrees. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, we, we, by studying these sound waves going through the whole universe, we realized something was damping them down, quieting down these sound vibrations. But whatever it was wasn't giving any contribution to the density of matter. And when we did the math, we found that whatever it was that was contributing that gravitational damping would be about 90% of the universe. So another confirmation of dark matter. When you run a computer simulation from the microwave background observations that we've taken, if you run what dark matter might have done over 13.7 billion years with all of this mass attracting together, you come up with this beautiful web-like structure. This is an invisible scaffolding of our universe that makes up almost all the matter in the universe. Isn't it possible that this would affect the way regular matter would evolve over time in the universe? And in fact, sure enough, this is a simulation of exactly that. Over time, all of the hydrogen gas, all of the regular matter was attracted by the gravity of this dark matter web underneath it. Things were brought together to form galaxies, to form stars and planets. Over billions of years in this simulation, we see galaxies drawing together from smaller galaxies, forming bigger ones, inside the galaxy, stars forming. None of that would have gotten started without that scaffolding of dark matter underneath, that gravitational binding of the entire universe. So is it possible the galaxies really look like this? Well, yes, in fact. This is a professor of mine at Harvard. He began to map, yeah, he began to map the distribution of the galaxies. And he found that if, you, if, if the Milky Way is here, if you look out in distance, galaxies seem to be forming voids and arcs. And in fact, now, the farthest out we can see with the digital Sloan Sky Survey, we can see that there is this beautiful web structure that the galaxies are forming, and we don't know what's underneath, except it has to be the dark matter. It's now got us wondering, really, how much this has affected the history of the universe. With our own galaxy cluster in the center looking out, we see that all the galaxies are mapped onto this beautiful web. So it seems like we need to find what this matter is. We're hoping our friends at CERN at the Large Hadron Collider will get to energies that will actually create a dark matter particle. Until that happens, it's still a mystery. And this must have had a huge impact on the universe. So when you think about how much matter is out there in a form that we can't see, we're down to the question, is the universe made of dark matter? And the rest of us is, doesn't matter. So thank you very much, and have a good night finding yourself home.